Okay, so it seems to me as though we are recording. So again, thank you very much for joining us for our uh, second session on the topic of security for the Microsoft 365 uh, environment. So before we um, sort of continue on, what I want to do is just cover off a quick summary or some additional thoughts here so that um, people can get a feel of where we are. And uh, if there are any questions on any of these matters. So um, to kick off yesterday, we talked about, um, you know, the landscape that is out there. Um, you know, the big the big question I think that a lot of people um, are asking, especially, you know, most businesses are asking is, you know, why is this still happening? Um, how can I, how can uh, IT basically still be failing, uh, still leaving us as vulnerable as we are? We're still seeing, you know, I would suggest we're still seeing major increases in the instances of cybercrime. So the major takeaway is going to be that the issue is not about technology. The issue is about people. OK, so it's people that write the software, it's people that install the software, it's people that configure the software, it's people that use the software, it's people that make mistakes when they're writing the code, when they have you know inappropriate configurations, when they click on a link that they shouldn't, or when they get enticed to uh, open material uh, and do those sort of things. It is people that have bad, bad passwords. The technology is really there to assist and the capabilities are generally built into the technology. The problem is, is generally the vast majority of issues that you find are basically failed configurations, right? So most cases is that, you know, someone didn't secure a password, someone didn't enforce MFA, somebody didn't do uh, restrictions, somebody didn't disable an account. Okay, so this failed configuration of pick your technology, it really doesn't matter, largely is going to come down to you know, the IT professional or the IT industry as such for not taking appropriate you know, best practices. So the idea here, as we talked about, is that you should be feeding in on a regular basis understandings and learnings around best practices. Now, where do those best practices come from? We talked about they can come from, you know, the Essential 8, they can come from uh, CISA, they can come from NIST, and they can obviously also come from, you know, the vendors like Microsoft. You know, what's Microsoft's recommendation for the way to configure spam filtering? Why is it recommended to set that SEL level to four and not to eight? What impact does that have? Now, the issue is, I think, as I mentioned, I think that, you know, when push comes to shove, if there is an incident, um, the questions are going to come from typically the lawyers um, based from insurance companies is, OK, that's all well and good, but what best practices did you follow? You know, why were you, why was this set up? Why was this configured? So I think one of the most important things to take away is, OK, what best practices are you following? right and be able to look at those and they will change they will update they will be different um, changes over time so a very good example you know uh, that i can give you is this concept of a 90 day you know password change or a mandatory um, 90 day password change okay all the current indications are that that is a very bad thing to do OK, now there are some people out there who still adhere or want to adhere to those sort of practices. OK, now that's where the need to keep up to date and the modern thinking, the modern approach is very important when it comes to best practices, because, you know, poor industry standards, poor <clears throat> practices, again, are what's going to catch you out. OK, so again, don't forget to look at and think about you know, what best practices are out there and how do I apply them? You don't have to necessarily take them word for word, but it's going to, you know, basically give you um, an important guiding step here. 
Now, one of the things that we looked at and thought about was that the, you know, the, the main target here, okay, is going to be email, without doubt. Email is going to be the number one clear winner for uh, how a threat is going to be delivered. Typically, it's going to be a you know, phishing style attack that is going to you know, want the user to click somewhere and either you know, basically steal their identity, okay, so get them to put in their login and their password, or it's going to get them to run something, a script or whatever, on their environment. But by far, email is going to be you know, the major vector that you need to make sure you have covered off. So as I said yesterday, there's plenty of talk out there about, you know, man in the middle, SMS attacks and edge case security, but it's the nuts and the bolts that really is going to save you. It's the basics and doing them well that is going to provide the best protection for any environment. And as I said yesterday, um, the idea here is, is that, you know, a configuration, a well-configured system will always beat features, right? So again, most vendors out there are, you know, selling you the features that'll do this, it'll do this, it'll have a spinning ball, it'll look pretty. But my advice is, is get the config down, make sure you're using all the features that are available to you in the product that you already have before you consider adding or augmenting what you have with additional features with additional product because every addition here basically decreases your security because it means something has to be configured something it now creates a gap or a potential gap between the configurations and handoffs and all that sort of stuff so adding more and more features does not make you more secure so a good example i can give you is if you add a third party backup as i mentioned yesterday you don't actually make your system any more secure. You don't make the customer any more secure unless you take time to understand how that third party is authenticating, where that data is stored. So when they back up data, where do they actually put it? And then, you know, who's got access to this? And as we've learned here, one of the big challenges is going to be supply chain. So anytime you've got a third party product in the mix here, it's going to be subject to third party, uh, sorry, supply chain attacks. Now, again, we've seen that with RMM tools, we've seen that with password managers, we've seen that with basically anything. So anytime you add an additional vendor, additional supplier into your mix, you potentially by default are reducing the security and you're increasing your risk because now you've got to configure that, set it up, manage it, maintain it, patch it, do all that sort of stuff. So again, look at the wider picture here. Don't get sucked in by all these features. It's like, okay, hang on, you know, the really practical stuff, does it do that as it does that? And again, a good, well-protected lockdown Windows 10 system will never have a problem. It really won't have a problem, although there's no absolutes in security. I 100% agree. But at the end of the day, like I said, you know, you want to do it well. Like a well-maintained car stands a much better chance in an accident or in a dangerous situation than a car that has the check engine light on, has bald tyres, the blinkers or the indicators don't work, the driver's not experienced. So again, you know, the basics are important. There's a question here from Cameron, what is your recommended authentication method for third-party connection? Well, my, uh, my recommended thing is that you shouldn't have a third party connection is the best type of connection. You question, why do I need this third party add-in? Is it really providing value? If you really have to add it and it does provide value, then you want to use modern authentication, right? So what is known as modern authentication? So that's going to support MFA, conditional access, um, you know, um, all of that sort of stuff is going to have to support modern authentication. Anything that we talked about yesterday with legacy auth where you get prompted for a login and a password in a dialogue box right you need to question because that is typically going to be legacy right so if we've got to put in you know the login here and the password here then that's not up to current standards 
All right. Now it's going to be hard. There's no doubt. There are vendors out there that are still running SQL 1998. There are still people out there who are using you know old methods of connectivity because they feel it's too expensive to update. So again, you may have the world's greatest product and it may solve a major problem in your environment, but at the end of the day, you really need to start thinking about this third party supply chain issue. What would happen if the backup, the third party backup vendor was compromised in some way, shape or form, could that allow access to all my tenants information or could that compromise the information? My third party password manager, could that compromise the whole environment? So again, even using something like, and I think, I'm not sure if we mentioned, I think we did mention it. If you're talking about something like Microsoft 365 Lighthouse, which allows multi-tenant access. So the idea is, is you have your, you know, partner tenant up here, and then underneath of that or connected to that, you have uh, basically, you know, all your, you know, customer tenants underneath it. That's great and that's convenient and that's, you know, one login here allows you to log in here. You know, that's fantastic. Don't get me wrong, convenient. But if this partner up the top here gets compromised, then potentially that means everyone they're connecting to gets compromised as well. So how do we minimise those sort of environments? Every third party, every connection, every high level escalation needs to be questioned and needs to be delivered and answered in such a way that it is all about moving the risk needle from high to low. So simple as that, we need to ask ourselves, does this make the risk of my client's data higher or lower? And if so, how can I set it up so I can be minimizing this risk on a regular basis? And that's going to happen today, tomorrow, in a week's time, a month's time, a year's time, when the pandemic's over, whatever. It's just going to be a case of how do we reduce risk? So again, a good example is, is step back and have a think about cars. You know, Back in the day when the cars first came around and replaced the horse, um, there were no traffic lights. There were no, no, everybody drove wherever they want. There was no agreement on which side of the road they drive and the cars weren't particularly safe. Look at it today. Everyone, every new car, ABS, uh, lane assist, lane warning, auto drive, a lot of them, um, seat belts, airbags, um, you know, all of that sort of stuff has been built in. People would not generally accept a car that hasn't got those sort of capabilities in it. So again, the same thing here, and that will continue to improve and enhance over time and just become part of the accepted norm. And again, that's the way you need to think. Now, part of this, as I sort of mentioned yesterday, the role that you've got to play here is you need to, you know, have a, if a customer says, no, I don't want to do MFA, well, then you really have to sit there and question as a provider, do I really want to deal with this customer? If they're going to fight me this much on an issue which we agreed yesterday or we showed statistics, that it reduces the risk by 99.9% .9 having MFA, if they're not wanting to do that, I, that is that makes no logic to me. Because if you come to me at a horse race and said, I'm going to guarantee, or I can give you a surety, 99.9% .9 that this horse is going to win, hmm, I'm pretty sure I'd take that bet. Okay, so again, you need to make a decision, right? So the idea here is that you need to be more discerning and basically say, you don't say yes to everything. If a customer says, oh, can I do this and be less secure and do this and do this? The automatic response should not be yes. The automatic response should be, well, let me consider that in the balance between, you know, the productivity, the uh, usability, and also the security. And I will tell you that at the end of the day, all customers are not good customers, right? you make far more money by being discerning and saying no more than you do saying yes. Okay? So the idea here is set your standards. What's your standard? And as we talked about, you know, what is your internal standard? Right? What is the standard that you hold your business to? 
as an example, right? Do you have MFA throughout everything? Okay. Do you have the things like app locker and application whitelisting? Do you have role-based authentication? Have you minimized the risk? How do you deal with insider threats? These are questions for your business as much as they are your customers. And customers aren't dumb because if you aren't doing the things you're trying to sell them, they're going to find out sooner or later and really ask you, you know, what credibility you have if you are out there talking to them and not implementing some of these things yourself. Now, the other fixture in this uh, mix here is our friends in the government. So the government is beginning to legislate, legislate more and more um, about having to be cyber secure, be cyber aware. So we've got the national data breach legislation, and we showed you a quote how if you are aware of a breach from a customer, even if the customer doesn't want to declare it, then you need to also think about whether you should declare it as well, because it is a mandatory requirement under the Privacy Act. So all of these things are creating a significant amount of challenges for those who are doing security, right? And the simpler you make it, the more based on standards, checklists, repeatable procedures, the easier it's going to become. Now, what we said, what I suggested yesterday is the starting point is Secure School, right? Without doubt, that is the place to start. That will give you a rating, okay, out of 100 in percentage terms, and it will also give you a to-do list. So it's going to give you a place to start. It's going to give you that for every single tenant, <clears throat> including your own. And my advice to you was was to start with your own tenant or our own environment and look to get this to at least 65, if not greater. Okay, I really wouldn't be comfortable unless it's in the range of 80% or more. So that should be the takeaway. Make sure that we get our tenant to those sort of level following, you know, the recommendations from uh, Microsoft. Because I've read and I've seen and I've heard chatterings about insurance companies wanting a benchmark to, you know, measure the security of their clients' environments. And secure score is one of the things that's being bandied around as some sort of generic uh, marker that, um, you know, insurance companies can use to measure customers. Now, once you've done your secure score, the next thing was your auditing, right, to make sure that your auditing is turned on. Okay, so we had the, um, you know, the unified audit logs that need to be turned on. We have uh, mailbox logs which need to be turned on and so on. So first order of business is to make sure that those things are turned on. Then we talked uh, about, you know, where are the logs, right? You know, where are they located? Which are the important logs? So the logs that we talked about important obviously are the, you know, the unified um, log logging there. And the other big one uh, to be familiar with um, was the Azure AD, right, um, signing logs, which are in the Azure AD portal. So again, make sure you're familiar with them, run a few queries, add the additional fields, uh, look at especially what I was keen to look at is go and have a look at those filed logins, right? See if you have any filed logins or the accounts have any filed logins uh, to, to be, to see whether you are potentially, you know, being uh, targeted uh, in any way. Now, once we've done our auditing, next step was to set up the alerts. Now you do get uh, a number of default alerts, as I said, depending on the SKU that you have. All right, now you can obviously add custom alerts as we talked about. So what custom alerts make sense? So one of the custom alerts that I like, right, is when a new, new SharePoint site is created. Why is that a handy thing to know? Well, guess what? When you create a new SharePoint site, what are you generally also creating? You're also generally creating a new team. 
Okay. Now, what's the other thing that a team creates apart from a SharePoint site? What's the other thing? So when you create a team, what does a team create? Right? So it does quite a few things, but what's a thing that a team creates? Anybody any suggestions there? Um, so Cameron's question following on while you're thinking about that. Uh, yes, it is a group, but what else specifically, more specifically? What do you get when you create a Microsoft group? Correct, you get a mailbox, right? What do you get when you get a mailbox? You get an email, you get a a mail address. So what happens if I created a team called accounts? What mailbox do I get? Accounts at yourdomain.com. So an employee, right, a nefarious actor could create a team called accounts and get an email called accounts and then use that to send and receive and pretend to be the accounts department of the business. Okay, so again, balance these sort of things up and understand what you get when you create things like Teams. So back on Cameron's question, what if the third party app is connected by enterprise app registration? Okay, so my question to you is, is if it is connected with an enterprise app, have you looked at that app? Have you seen what permissions that app has? And we'll talk about this a little bit more today when we talk about OAuth applications, because that's effectively what they are. What's stopping a backup provider taking every single write? Because if you want to back up your data, what are you going to need? You're going to need rights to everything, aren't you? So what is an enterprise app protected with? It's protected with a login and a password and no MFA. What happens if that enterprise app credentials and identity gets out in the wild and becomes a subject of supply chain attack? That's basically a conduit straight into your business or into, into the business where that enterprise app is installed. So it comes with risk, okay? Go in and understand what the risks are, how to do it, how to mitigate it. But my interpretation is I'm not gonna allow anybody inside my tenant that I don't understand what they are doing, how they are doing, why they are doing, and putting monitoring and tracking on it so I know when they access this sort of information, okay? So again, there are lots and lots of ways to lock these things down. IP addresses, someone's mentioned. But again, information is power here. Understand the threats that you and the risks that you face. Don't just allow people to put stuff in there without understanding the security implications or eventually you will pay the price, I think. So as mentioned, the attacker is going to come at you typically, again, via email. Okay, so it's going to look to send you emails. And we talked about the DNS records that were important. So we talked about SPF. We talked about DKIM. We talked about DMARC. So hopefully everybody here has at least gone in and had a look at those or understand what they are um, after yesterday's discussion and looking to implement them if they don't and then implement them basically for our every single customer uh, that there is. Then we talked about um, inbound filtering. Right? So our anti-spam, anti-malware, connection filtering, all of that into Exchange Online and also into Microsoft Defender for Office 365. We also talked about outbound. That is just as important. Make sure that you have your policies you know, set up for that um, as well. Whoops, so here is another question for you, right? So here is another thing to consider. Do you, who here configures Microsoft Defender for Office 365, so the anti-phishing, anti-spoofing, who sets that up, whoops, who sets that up? Just minimise my thinking. So who sets that up for insiders? Who sets up Defender for Office 365 to check phishing from internal senders, right? Because if, I if I'm an attacker and I compromise an email box, I'm going to pretend or I'm going to appear to be that employee, right? So again, this is where you need to start thinking about, okay, what's the potential impact here? Your threats aren't just outside the organization. The majority of them are, there's no question. But an insider can do far more damage, far quicker, than an outsider can. So again, begin to ask yourself the question, what would happen if 
rogue employee, what would happen if this was compromised and then started doing this or accessing bank accounts or adding additional users? What's the implication here? Okay. One of the things we talked about was the fact that um, we don't need to consider third party um, you know, email filters in front of Office 365, they just um, make the product less effective. Okay, we talked about um, the tools Microsoft provides, the config analyzer, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, routing or sorry, the reporting capability that showed us what emails were trapped by each individual policy. So we had an idea of how effective our policies were. We also talked about if we have uh, Microsoft Defender for Office 365 P2, we can implement something called attack simulation. So we can run attack simulated phishing attacks on our users internally. We can do password spray attacks. We can do all sorts of things across our internal users, get nice reporting and also send them off to do uh, online training uh, as well. Now, one of the reasons we also talked about this was um, the desire, the need to remove legacy auth. Okay, so again, we need to eliminate this as quickly as we can. That can be a challenge, I 100% admit, but there are ways around it because legacy auth is really going to give us um, the password spray attacks, which is effectively a brute force of um, passwords, just going to keep guessing passwords uh, until it gets in. Now, remember, legacy auth is going to have its biggest impact typically on uh, things like, you know, POC3, IMAP, um, you know, Old World SMTP, uh, Old World SMTP, sorry. So they're the things that you need to look at. Who uses IMAP today? Mm, very few people or businesses I know, okay? So the idea here is, is to make sure that you've minimized those protocols. We talked about the need to protect our shared mailboxes and the risk that they uh, potentially introduce into our environment. You need to have them, you use them, they provide a reliability, but there should be no login from the web to a shared mailbox, okay? So shared mailboxes are accessed by this is a user's mailbox. This is the shared mailbox. Shared mailbox. This is the way that the data is accessed, mailbox to mailbox. It doesn't go out through the internet and come back through the web. Okay, that does not happen. It goes mailbox to mailbox inside Microsoft, whoops, inside Microsoft 365. Okay, so there's no reason to have a shared mailbox that is accessible from the web. So again, something you should turn off. Now, the big takeaway hopefully was MFA everywhere. No excuse for not using MFA. The stats were mind blowing. Um, I'd have to go and research and see if there are any newer stats, but just totally unbelievable. Um, that something that will give you effectively a 99.9% .9 you know, assurity against compromise is failing to be implemented. And the way that we said we could address some of the pain was with passwordless login. Okay, so this is the push notification to your phone where you don't need to put the password in, you simply uh, acknowledge something on your phone. So there are lots of ways to minimize that and that's a, a big differentiation you can bring to the market. We also talk about, mentioned the advantage of uh, branding. So branding the tenant, putting some sort of uniqueness around it, making it stand out from the crowd so that if they are fished, hopefully it will uh, make users stop and think. And like I said, it's not a be all and end all, but it certainly is uh, something to help users uh, identify and do the right thing. We need to help our users do the right thing as best we can. We also talked about the fact that security defaults are now on what they are basically do they enforce uh, effectively MFA and they uh, will also disable uh, legacy auth. Okay, so they're gonna turn off legacy auth, but as we mature in our security posture, we are going to want to turn these off 
when we set up our custom configuration, our custom rules. So it's a great starting point, but it's not going to be something generally that is going to be left on uh, for uh, forever. All right, so I think basically that's sort of where we got to uh, yesterday. I will pause and let's have a look at any questions that have come through. So um, question from Kevin here, shared mailbox access from the web, any specific license required to make this happen? No, shared mailboxes require no licensing except the license for a mailbox for a user, okay? What I said yesterday was if you go and have a look at your users, let me pull up a tenant here. So if I go and have a look at a tenant here and I go in and look at my admin and I go and look at my users, do, 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 do. look at my users. If I go to my users here, active users, and I do a search for info, right? So info is a shared mailbox. Here it is here, right? This is a shared mailbox, okay? But you'll see that it basically can have its sign in like a normal user. So I blocked this because I did this manually. But if you have shared mailboxes, go in and have a look at your shared mailbox in your active users and you will find that their sign ins are not blocked by default which means potentially you can get into it via a, a web page. Okay, so again, that should never ever be the case. So go and eliminate that. So you will never ever uh, have that issue would be my suggestion. I'm not quite sure by you what you mean by redirect. Um, so at the end of the day, turn that web access off. Just turn the web access off and you'll never have a problem because nobody accesses a shared mailbox via the web interface. All right, any other questions? Any other questions? People brave enough to ask them? No? Well, from memory yesterday, this is effectively where we got to. Okay, so we need to start talking about uh, Microsoft Defender. Now, Microsoft Defender, you need to think about as a brand. Okay, it's not a the AV on your endpoint. It's not the uh, safe link, safe whatever. It's an overarching brand like Microsoft 365. So Microsoft 365 Business Premium, okay, is a product under the Microsoft 365 brand. Defender is exactly the same. So in Defender, we have um, Defender for Endpoint, we have Defender for Office 365, we have Defender for Identity. Now these have come from, as you can see on the left there, you can now see that these have come from you know, Azure, they've come from Office 365, ATP. So as Microsoft um, has tends to do, it's decided to bring these all under one brand. So all of this is now classified as a Microsoft Defender product. And for example, the protection of the devices, the AV, the EDR, the XDR, uh, is now known as Microsoft Defender for Endpoint. So again, think of that protecting your devices. The safe link, safe attachments, anti-phishing is the Defender for Office 365. So that's the old Office 365 ATP. Uh, and obviously there's the same sort of things uh, for the on-prem servers, VMs and so on. So one of the good things to think about is this kill chain concept, right? So, okay, we showed you a bit of a kill chain to start off with. When an attacker gains access, what do they do? They send an email, someone opens it, it runs a script. The script then sets up persistence. Persistence then tries to access additional resources and it upscales and it jumps from here, jumps to there. So again, what's the kill chain here? So Defender for Office 365 will sit in there and again, help you protect your emails, which we agreed yesterday was going to be the major en uh, entry point. If we want to protect our devices, we're looking at Defender for uh, endpoint protection. We've also got uh, Azure Defender, which will protect our identities, our on-prem, our servers, our domain controllers, and importantly, send a lot of those signals up to the cloud to give us indications of what's going on in the environment. 
We then have Azure AD identity protection. So identity protection is going to look at, okay, where's the login coming from? How often is it happening? Is it happening at certain times? Have I seen this login uh, details on the dark web? Does this look suspicious and so on? And to monitor a lot of this, we also have cloud app security that will again, give us this overview. Now we talked about the upside down triangle. Uh, that's where we're moving today. We're moving from talking about individual logs, turning on audits, uh, enabling alert policies, getting those things to fire off. And now we're gonna start moving to the bottom of the triangle. We're looking at using intelligent systems like cloud app security, identity protection to give us the information that we need and tell us what we need to really worry about. But the old Office 365 ATP service is now Defender for Office 365. And the simple way of thinking about this is that it is a way to provide two forms of protection. The first is it will look at the attachments that are received and determine whether it considers those to be malicious. If it is malicious, it will then open that attachment in a sandbox in a Microsoft data center, and it will monitor what that actually does. Does it modify the registry? Does it launch or does it try and phone home? And then it will protect the environment. So again, a lot of these zero day stuff, again, cannot be determined until it is actually opened and its behavior reveals itself. At the other end, it will also look at the links that are part of those emails. You know, are they suspicious? And effectively will run all of those links through a proxy. So when a user clicks on a link, uh, it will run it through a reputation proxy that will judge whether that um, is going to a malicious site or not. Now, as I've said, there is no absolutes in security. Nothing is perfect here, okay? Is it still possible for something to get through? Potentially, right? But again, this is where we set up our policies. This is where we set up our best practices and the chances of that happening are very, very unlikely. All right, now, as mentioned yesterday, remember that a lot of these things don't have policies set up for them out of the box. You need to go in and set up those policies. So when you add this license to your environment, as you'll see, you get three new options here, anti-phishing, safe attachments and safe links as we mentioned yesterday. Now, if we look at safe attachments, and it is a bit hard to see this, I agree, but the idea here is that we set up a policy that says, okay, when a suspect attachment is received, what do we do with it? Do we block it? Do we alert the user? Do we deliver it? Do we ignore it? Do we move it? How do we deal with it? Now, generally best practice is obviously to uh, block it. Now, there is an option in safe attachments to do what's called dynamic delivery. So dynamic delivery would actually deliver the email body, the text, and then send a little or attach a little stub that says, hey, guess what? This attachment looks suspect. I'm currently going to uh, be scanning that. It will be coming shortly. Please be patient, but you can read the email message. Now, that makes a lot of sense pragmatically. It gets the email body to me quickly. I can make decisions and feel comfortable that I've receive the email. But as we all know, that's not how customers think. Customers have a major freak out when they don't get their attachment and they said that it's waiting. So my best practice is, is that let, AT, uh, let Defender for Office 365 fully scan it, fully make its decision before it's delivered. Yes, it might be an extra 30 seconds, an extra 60 seconds before the user gets it, but who cares? Okay. My experience has been is do not implement dynamic delivery because it causes an unbelievable amount of angst for the end user because they just don't understand. So again, just treat it as a policy of I'm scanning it and I will deliver it. The user won't even know it's there until it is actually delivered. So I think that's a much better, more practical approach to it. Now with safe links, as I said, you need to set a policy and that policy will then determine how dodgy links are set up and uh, configured there, right? So you can then set the policy to say, okay, well, if it is malicious, are, am I gonna allow the user to click through it? Can they bypass it? Can they override it? Or are they largely blocked from, you know, from that capability, all right? So again, the idea here is the, the reason that the policies aren't uh, put in place 
initially is because someone needs to make a decision about what those policies are going to be. Okay. Now, I will tell you that a lot of the intelligence or a component of the intelligence comes from this site here called Virus Total. So if you haven't seen this site, you can basically go and upload a file. You can uh, put in a URL and it will then tell you based on the number of engines uh, that are out there as to whether it thinks that is a dodgy link rated by a number of different engines. Now, before you go charging in there and using it, I will put in a caveat here. Just remember that anything you submit to Virus Total, right, the document, the link, whatever you put up in there will be captured and retained by Virus Total and used for their commercial benefit, which means they typically um, you know, use that with virus researchers to look at uh, how viruses are being deployed. So remember, anything you submit to Virus Total becomes the commercial property, that's the agreement of Virus Total. But this is very, very handy. So if you're wondering why your link or why your uh, environment um, you know, is being seen as uh, bad, I would start looking at something like Virus Total to give you a better feedback as to, okay, well, that's interesting. You know, seven of 70 sites have seen it as dodgy. Okay, so my experience is, is that it largely interacts with this uh, virus uh, total site and uses that to get a, you know, an amount of its intelligence uh, from. So again, um, the policies here, so let's go into security. We'll go into the new uh, console so you can have a look. Do, 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 do. Wait for this to come up. Get back to the slide deck that I can see. So let me get back. Sorry, let me get back to that. Loading, loading, loading. Okay. So again, the idea here is we can go into our policies and our rules, and it wants me to take the tour again. Believe me, I've taken the tour many times. And let's close this and let's go to policies. We go into our threat policies. And as mentioned yesterday, here is the anti-phishing, anti-spam, anti-malware, safe attachments and safe links, right? So if you go into safe links, as I mentioned yesterday, you'll see that uh, generally there is no default policy when you go in there the very first time. Make sure that you also go in there and configure any global settings. And remember that these safe links can also be applied to OneDrive for Business and to Teams as well. You'll need to go in and create your own uh, policy. You can have multiple policies targeting different domains, different users having different protection settings. So maybe certain users can have the email dynamically delivered because they understand other users, maybe not. So you can set as many policies uh, basically in there as you want. The other one you may want to consider here is the notification settings. And again, I would caution against the fact of um, you know alert alert overloads. Very easy to overload yourself with lots and lots of emails. The interesting one I think here is the anti phishing because again, there's not specifically a lot of knobs and dials you can turn. Uh, that give you, you know, a number of reference. A lot of it is based on uh, intelligence. So it looks at the message header, it looks at how it was delivered, what the language is, um, all of that sort of stuff. But if you go down here, um, you'll see that you can determine whether it's quarantine, junked or whatever. And uh, you'll see here that you can turn on the impersonation for owned or custom domains and you can determine whether to apply this to your internal environment as well. So between user, uh, user to user uh, style, um, you know, environment. If you if you wish to, uh, if you wish to do that. So again, have a think about it. It's all about policy here, right? What makes sense? What's best practice? So that safe links. Now remember, as I said, nothing's perfect. Okay. You could be subject to you know, a zero day or an early in a campaign and it may not have picked it up yet. So your best defense is obviously well-informed users who ask the question rather than randomly go and click on any link that they can find. But we all know um, they are rare individuals. 
The other side of the coin, as we indicated, was the reporting that you get. Remember that you get some in the console. You can spit it out to Power BI. You can pull it into things like Log Analytics, Azure Sentinel, which we will talk about. So you have all that capability if you want to take it to the next level. As mentioned, the Defender for Office 365 will integrate when enabled. Key thing there is when configured and enabled for Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, and so on. So it will basically ensure that the files uploaded or downloaded from those environments will also be protected. And as noted, remember that it's looking at, you know, third party reputations, it's looking at multiple AV engines. Uh, it's not just, you know, the, the it's not all internal to the Microsoft uh, environment. So hopefully everybody's fairly happy and fairly comfortable with Microsoft Defender for Office 365. So the renaming, the role that it plays, there are two plans. Plan one is included in Microsoft 365 Business Premium. Plan two is in E5 and can be an add-on. It largely, P2 largely adds the attack simulator capability. So the ability to test users out and then provide them online, integrated online training around uh, helping them to understand how to protect themselves. So that's the major difference between P1 and P2. All right, um, are there any questions on the Microsoft uh, 365? Sorry, the Defender for uh, Office 365 there. Any questions coming through? No. All right, well, I think what we'll do is before we jump on to the next little topic here, I might just um, initiate the, oh, I, I left my timer running. That's no good. Look at that, four hours ago. I wonder what I was doing four hours ago. Okay, so let's put our timer into play here. Uh, press this, reset this. Just check to see there are, uh, any questions? Any questions? No? All right. So what I'm going to do is I will stop the recording.